This is Rada from the Red Table Up, coming at you with a special time period of a movie review observation number 209. We're trying to get back on the Saturday routine, but it's been an issue with certain Saturdays being pretty busy or not having enough movies to have viewed. So I'll start with, I watched the first movie, The Tank, and, uh, you know, being barely 100 minutes, that was a good thing. It took place in the past, and it was this whole, well, you didn't know, but your family had this past. Your mother has this property. When she died, they didn't tell you that you inherited this. It took way too long. Your life, you're struggling financially with this uh, pet store they have. And they want to have a veterinary clinic inside this family with this one girl, I think, and their dog. And they're like, cool, let's find this property because then maybe we can live here and save money because we already own it. Or we could fix it up and sell it. And then guess what happened? Turns out there's a mysterious thing of why the mother never mentioned it and what happened in the past. And they got to deal with the creatures and they're like reptilian creatures and they try to and they got to survive it and they're just like probably would have been best to sell it so it wasn't bad it wasn't great it was, it was okay but like the the main dude got like super injured so she was the wife was the heroine in the movie saving the day so it was okay definitely better than some of the things i've watched recently then i got to watch just league crisis on infinite earths part two and again barely 90 minutes the first one i thought was really good this one was more of let's go flashback to what the monitor is and where he comes from, how the Supergirl connection comes through. Um, Psycho Pirate's past. And again, Psycho Pirate's a bad guy, so I still don't understand why he was recruited by the monitor when he's a bad guy, no matter what earth he's on. And yeah, they're having all these like uh, Batman characters, like Batman Beyond, Batwing, Batgirl, Batwoman, not Batwoman, but Batgirl, both Dick Grayson, Robin, and a, you know, Damian Wayne one, so it was interesting. They had all these characters, and they're all trying to work together. One woman with an uh, Amazonian all like planet where they're all in charge of it and stuff, and they're trying to save the day. And it introduced like the Anti Monitor and some other things like that. But it was, in my opinion, a little bit too boring. A lot of backstory and explaining things of how they got there, and not much like resolution on things to do and how to fix things. So overall, like they had some more characters, they introduced more people, there was more talking roles. So it was a little bit interesting here and there, but for the most part, the first one was way better and eventually gonna watch special features. But overall, like the first one was way, way better. I, I, it was nice they gave us an explanation on stuff, but for the most part, I felt it was lacking on it, it kind of be boring. Then I watched The Good Mother, and a lot of people on the internet go, there are a lot of plots where parents look into the disappearance of a kid or the murder of a kid or what's happening. And, of course, she's a reporter, and she did that in that TV show in Alaska, which wasn't that great. And again with Hilary Swank, like, I can't really name all the great movies she's been in because it's hard to remember. I remember a lot of the bad ones. But literally in this movie, she her son has passed away because he's dealt with drugs or whatever. He's in the wrong crowd. He apparently has a girlfriend that's also been a drug addict and has a baby. He dies. The two of them meet. And they're trying to figure out what happens to her son. And then it's very confusing because it was abruptly very short and ends for this movie that's barely, you know, an hour and 20 minutes with hour 20 minutes of credits. They, I felt like they, everyone, I agree with their critics. They rushed through the second part of the movie. And I'm just trying to figure it out. Like, did her older son, who's a cop, have anything to do with her son dying? Her other son dying, or he's involved. It wasn't very clear, but I felt like even though it wasn't well written, I could still figure out exactly that maybe the older brother was involved. I don't know. It, it was okay. It just wasn't that great. A little bit confusing because they could have... It, it's one of the few instances where the movie, if it was a little longer, may have helped. Then I watched the movie Sacro with Donnie Yen, where apparently this takes plat takes in the plaster. got two rival samurai gangs or whatever it is. And they're, you know, sworn enemies, whatever. And apparently he's being framed for murder of his adopted parents and the sensei and all this other stuff. And this lady accuses him of murder and they believe. And the whole movie is him trying to reclaim his name and his honor that he was stripped of and banished and all this other stuff. And everyone keeps trying to fight him and he dies so many times he come back to life like a... Didn't seem that realistic, but again, it's a samurai movie with all these people who also had, like, powers, like, flaming hands and, like, pushing people back with, like, the wind and stuff. And again, he was directed by him, so this is all uh, all about him and stuff. So, again, it was pretty cool. A lot of fighting in martial arts, and it's two hours and ten minutes, apparently, with uh, 
credit. So I, I enjoy the martial art and the fighting scenes. Just the overall script wasn't was kind of lacking. But at least they gave you an option of watching it in English. So you didn't have to read subtitles. Then I watched the movie Buddy Games, Spring Awakening. So this was a, the, the Kung Fu movie. But so Buddy Games is a great movie about a group of friends who continue to do these weird things, even though they're in like the 30s or 40s. And of course, Nick Swarston, he's up for anything. Adam Sandler either puts him in a movie that they're in together and he does stupid stuff, or the whole Bucky Larson born to be a star. So he's no joke to that. And the least famous guy in this movie, Dan Bacadal, also, I feel like he's up for a lot of physical humor and comedy. It was pretty funny. And the other movie had, you know, Dax Shepard, who's really funny, and it had Jensen Ackles as his brother, and Olivia Munn was in the last one. So there was a lot of characters in the last one that were good. And then I love James Rodney Rodriguez based on the fact that he was really good on A Million Little Things. He was, like, I think my favorite character. And Kevin Dillon, since Entourage, has been in the whole straight-to-DVD movie franchise. So, like, this one is not really a, a, a movie theater movie. It's been more the one straight-to-DVD. And, like, that's his, by his MO. And he's been to, and he's had some questionable movie that he's signed on, but he's not his brother, Kevin Dillon, who stars in big-time film. I mean, Matt Dillon, excuse me. His name's Kevin. So he doesn't sign up to the big ones. And no offense to Lock Moreno, you've been in a lot of these Bruce Willis movies and some other movies, but playing like this fake Texan who's like the uncle of Dax Shepard and Jensen Ackles isn't great, but then they brought Jennifer Goodwin, which was interesting into this movie. And the whole point of the movie is, if you've seen the first one, again, they're a really tight-knit group. Apparently, they, I, if, I, I, I have, if I'm Dax Shepard, I'm a big enough actor that I don't need to be in a second movie that isn't really in the movies, a straight-to-DVD kind of release thing. I just won't be in it. I understand that. Josh Dumel, this is all his project. Like, he's the one that's behind the Buddy Games movie. He's behind the game show he hosted. Like, this is his passion. Like, this is something that's all about him. And that's something he is really in charge of. Like, producing and coming up with it and stuff. So, of course, he's a big-time actor. He's not going to drop out of this. But I'm surprised that James Rode Rodriguez, who has a, whose show Mill Little Things ended a few years ago, as of now... And he's not, like, in anything major why he would agree just to be on Zoom and be over the top with his character who's gay, which is no problem with character gay. He's, like, way over the top on it. And it's, like, little vignettes throughout the movie of him checking in. I feel like he, it was, it was lacking that he wasn't in the most of the movie. There's no offense to, you know, Nick Swarston and Dan Brackadol and Kevin Dillon, but I don't think that the three of them lead a movie and make it funny. I feel like Josh Jumel is always the leader, the straight guy of the group, that they kind of needed another person to do that, but he wasn't there. Justin Ackles over the top is like a revengeful brother who wanted Dax Shepard's ashes. But the whole point of the movie is they go to this bar and they see that this bartender has taken their buddy games and been doing it for years and they stole it from him because apparently they just screwed him over with, a, with an injury. And it's played by Gary Chalk who's been in like Stargate and a bunch of other Canadian projects and he's a really good character actor, so he's the bartender. And Jennifer Goodwin is Dax Shepard's like long lost girlfriend. And overall, I don't understand why they made a sequel. I had some laughs. There were some laughs. There was some funny stuff. Them tripping out on drugs and, you know, Ben being old and not understanding the young people with the parties and the festivals and keeping up with them. So that was funny. A lot of physical humor for Swarston and Back Adult. So that was interesting. But again, I didn't. I felt like there was no need for a sequel, especially the sequel is not going to have Dax Shepard. And James Rode Rodriguez was barely going to be in the movie. And it's just plot wasn't that great. Then I watched the movie I Can. And if you pay attention, I'm a sucker for all sports movies, no matter if they're based on a true story or not. And this is apparently based on a true story. And, uh, yeah. <coughs> the idea is she's like, doesn't have a fully formed arm, but she's a softball star because that's what her family does. Her father, softball coach, all the girls. And I will say this, like the guy who played her grandfather, I've seen him in plenty of TV shows and movies, longtime character actor, the doctor, whose apparent name is Vernon Wells, which confused me with the actual baseball player. And of course, the guy who played the college coach, I've seen him. So three character actors I've recognized, but I didn't recognize the parents or the siblings, obviously. And it was very hokey and cheesy because it's all about Christian faith of the two of them had an illegitimate relationship. And I don't know if both of them were married at the time or he was, but now they're having a family together and he feels like he's being punished for that with the kid. The grandmother's cancer doesn't want to um, continue treatment. She's like, let God, let me be with God. So you had a whole grandma dying of cancer. 
you know, the whole where she has a horrible ACL injury in her junior year and she's going to miss her senior year and how's it going to affect her with scholarships and stuff and her family values and things like that. Again, sports movie, overcoming odds, inspirational, cool. But this was way too cheesy and hokey and, you know, too Christian-y and the whole thing. The script wasn't that great. And then the movie just abruptly ends and it's like an hour and 20 something minutes. Like, bam, it ends with like, oh yeah, I want to be able to play my senior year even though I'm injured. It would have been cool to see her maybe see if she came back her senior year, see her in college, but like it just, bam, abruptly ends. So cheesiness, hokiness, not a great script and being abruptly short, negatives about it. Then I watched the movie, The Man From Rome, Richard Armitage, and this was like an hour and 20 something made a movie where there was like some post credits. And this movie also had some post credit scenes about like kids with disabilities and buying movie tickets for them and helping them out like, that was really needed in the movie. And so this movie had a long credit scene. It started with the man from Rome, like two to three minutes with like Vatican stuff. And, you know, I was like, okay, cool. So this movie is basically, he's a father, but he's also a Vatican operative and he intelligence op oper operative. And he has to go to figure out like why this church has people dying and there's all the mysterious deaths and the people behind it. And there's a whole like land ownership dispute between a husband and wife and, you know, he, of course, gets involved with the wife because she's trying to divorce her husband and the husband's, like, shady and criminal. And there are all these things they uncover about not just the priest who's there, but other people in the Vatican. And it's like a secret agent James Bond movie about, you know, like a, a, a you know, a priest being a, pope, you know, a reverend, whatever, being a secret agent. He gets to carry guns and figure things out. He's got, like, a computer room of nerds and then he brought the tech guy with him. So like overall, it was an interesting plot trying to figure out what's going on and having all this espionage and then being a secret agent and stuff, but also being a priest. Like the script wasn't the best. It was certainly interesting enough to pay attention and want to watch it. But outside of Richard Armitage, I didn't really know anyone else in this movie. So basically, I would say Man from Rome is watchable, but it's not like the greatest script. It's interesting. I can, not the greatest script, short and too Christian-y if you don't want to watch a sports movie. Buddy Game Spring Awakening, you know, has his laugh, but again, there was no point of the movie and you're missing characters. If you like martial arts and fighting, Sakura is a good enough movie to watch. It's just a little bit too long. Not the best script. The Good Mother, again, abruptly ends. You think you know, I, I told you what I think the plot is, but it's just not worth it. Just the Crescent Infinite Earth Part 2 I was a little disappointed how boring it was. And then The Tank was an interesting enough horror film, but you know how these things end. And then lastly, I went to movie theaters and saw the movie Twister since I last recorded a video. Um, it's a standalone pre uh, sequel to Twister where Daisy Edgar Jones is the new Helen, Ho Helen Hunt, I think her name is. So for basically that... Yeah, it's Helen Hunt, where basically she's like this expert... But trauma from her past uh, prevents her from wanting to um, continue to do this. Uh, Glenn Powell is like a tornado wrangler. So he's got this cocky dude who just, they do videos and got his own set of crew. And I've seen a lot of those actors before. And, and then we have Anthony Ramos of In the Heights and Transformer movies and all these other stuff. And it's nice to see him come up and get some bigger roles. And he and Daisy Edgar Jones have a past where they were storm chasers in the end. And they bring the whole invention that Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton created, Dorothy, Bill Paxton's sons in the movie. There was some like, you know, little, little things here and there that had funny comeback in lines and interesting special effects for things. And yeah, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't horrible. I enjoyed watching it, but again, it's like two hours long. It's not as good as the first one. And like, it just, you know, the whole, will they, won't they? They kept, like, kind of forcing the issue with, like, them getting close to each other and really wanting to do things together. And it kind of ends a little bit like, oh, are they going to be together? So, overall, like, it's a washable movie and I enjoyed it. I just thought the first Twister, which I saw the other week, like, the original one was definitely a lot better. But it had similar, like, plot lines of them trying to literally do what they're supposed to do. And they kept failing, keep trying again and again. But yeah, thanks for listening to another show of Movie Observations, number 209. For On the Red Table Lock, I'm Radar. See you guys next time.